Fed Day Warriors. Hi, Shahab. Mark, Ren, how are you? Brock, how's it going? Everyone ready for the Fed? I'm doing okay, Ingmar. Okay. So a couple of things, Pete, a couple of things I'm looking for. I'm looking for one more high in the S&Ps for a three. Let's see where that would come in. Kind of anchor it here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> looks like, looks like it's going to come in around thirty two sixty. All right, now we'll do it. How, how do you guys like my shaky hands? All right, thirty two fifty ish. We'll see what happens with RSI. I'd like to see the RSI stay under 70 if we get this attempt. We've recovered it. Okay. All right. So there's one three drive um, oil. I don't know if it's going to have it in there, but you know, you have a one here and a two. Maybe one more actually caught this uh, Sunday night and day traded it. Uh, oil should peak before we get an S&P correction, so maybe we're not going to get a new high here. But when I look at this RSI, it says it's pretty possible. No matter what has happens to the S&Ps, and Steve showed a great chart. Okay. VIX looks pretty good to me. And, you know, you could do something with VIX, especially if we get a rally. You know, people say, well, how do you define uh, your risk if you do a VIX trade? You know, I would think that call options in here, you know, maybe the 30 or 35 strike by a couple months worth of time and risk closes under 24. And I'm saying closes under 24 because uh, that's a 200 day and it tried to close underneath it, but didn't and recent bounce so you know we start penetrating this 35 level i mean 35 calls will pay but we start getting through there 45 to 50 is doable and you know steve and i were talking about being long vix down here you know i was only look i only looked for 28 at the time but and we had this so starting to look like it, it's rounding out a bottom uh, I don't know. I, the guys will fill you in on that. And you guys know I turned around on the gold. I didn't buy it, but not bearish anymore. I think that we could have blow to, through one more high, you know, up here, 1780. We'll see. But I'll tell you what, there is something I'm looking at in silver, and silver is a lot stronger than gold today. Um, look at this, look at this, here's one, and this is setting up pretty classically. Here's your divergence up here. You know, we've been playing with this, uh, 78.6 level. We should get another high in silver and it's not that far away, you know, about 50, 60 cents. And if we don't trade above 70 on a lot of different time frames, silver is going to become, <clears throat> thank you, Joe, silver is going to become the preferred short because down here on the gold silver ratio, it came out pretty good yesterday. It's given some back today with silver strength, but this could be bottoming out here. All right. Maybe there's another shot down here, but. Uh, I don't want to make silver the preferred long here. Maybe after a rally, but not down here. 1814. 
Okay, uh, that's not a new high. Right. I'm looking for this high to be taken out. So we have a little different look on silver peat. I'm looking for this high to be taken out. The highs up here were 1838 or so. So you're looking for a failing rally here. Okay, we'll see. And this really uh, completely, I've been waiting for a rally all week to get on board and look what the end did in one week. So we had the throw over going home Friday and then back inside the formation and now breaking down. Okay. So I can't short the end down here. Still think there might be some type of retrace of this, but when you look at the end, it's done this before. See here, here, you know, if you waited for a rally, you never got one. So we've taken out this support too, right? The 108 level. So it looks ugly, but you know, I, I can't, I'm not going to fade it and buy it here, and I can't sell it here. So I just wait and be patient for the next move. Also, um, looking at individual currencies, what a great call by Grega. I think he's about to uh, ring the register. 128 was his target from all the way down here. But we're starting to get some non confirmations there in cable. Look at this. Almost at uh, 128 was his target. We're almost there. And the euro similar. I know a lot of people are talking 1420. Uh, Euro's trying to make a new high. So 1420 is another 40 two pips away and then i know a lot of guys and uh, raksha who i interviewed last week and i got something from tracy at shy girl yesterday um there are some numbers i don't know and there's a uh, scott and the eagles has had this number for a long time 95 60 ish 95 60 ish okay and we're not that far away. We're starting to get some, you know, non-confirmations here in the dollar. We've surpassed the 78.6. I, I did see the number here somewhere. Okay, 95.60 is 88.6 back from this home loop. So there are some people looking for us not to take out the stops here and put in a higher low um, anywhere from here to 40 lower. So I'm going to wait for the Fed announcement to do anything here. You have 9506. Okay. So there's a lot of people looking at it. This line comes in right near new lows, 9460. Oh, also Andy Pacioli came in, right? Said that he has a turn on the 12th, which is Friday. So, you know, that's part of the reason I bring people in. They give us some things to look for. And he has a pretty good rep as a cycle guy. So we'll pay attention to Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday in that window for a turn. And that's about all I have. I also, we have another cycle guy. Um, ben Maldonado is going to be with us today. And Ben's work is excellent. So stick around for that. And get signed up here. So here, if you didn't believe me, maybe Greg had took it. Yeah, so he just took it. There it is, 4.49% target hit, 128. Okay, so the pattern in plates, Blake had a, a long end that was working. So, you know, this is just part of it, the pattern in place. It's all the research that you're going to get there. So, so Greg laid it out. He has a, it a little bit higher. There's so many resources here, guys. 
think we'll have a, uh, anyone interested in a six month or one year subscription? Raise your hand if you are. I'll put you in touch with uh, Joe Perry. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. And also, don't forget about our sponsor, Forest Park. The reimbursement program is still going if you're overseas. And they rep them all. They're a broker's broker. If you need to find a new account, you want to have more than one account, there's no law against it. And I think that's it for me. So good luck today, everyone on the Fed. Okay. And bring Blake in now. Thank you hey, very much. Hey, good morning, much. Coach. Hey, bro. How's it going? Okay. Pretty good. Okay. What's that? Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, you, you sound a little down today. Oh, my roommate's sick and I'm nervous. My Ooh. buddy. Yeah. Okay. That's why. Like, is he like, well, let's Coughing, just hope he... temperature. Yeah. You know, it could be something else, but anyway, it's just a weird environment. <clears throat> where you have to be afraid of someone having sniffles and coughs and yeah it, it's, it's like it, it's, living in the black plague era or something you know so right yeah, so i'm a little apprehensive right now got please. it okay so that that uh, explains your uh, uh <laughs> mood today <laughs> tentative yeah okay <laughs> well on so that chills. Yeah. we're gonna we're going to uh where everybody here that's listening in is going to um uh you know give their prayers to Dale and his, uh, and his, uh, and his, uh, his buddy. Yeah. And, um, thank you, Blake. Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, we don't have, you know, we, the, the, unfortunately the, um, the world does not stop and we have yeah. today, we have the FOMC, right? Right. Yep. Now you pointed out that, uh, that the precious metals are very strong and, um, yeah. you know, silver's, Silver's got that. I mean, silver's got a really big move going on. But I, I want to. I want to talk a little bit, bit before I go into those. I want to talk about the euro. Um, this is a uh, this is a longer term chart of the euro dollar. You can see going all the way back mm. to two thousand eight. This is a weekly chart, right? So nice I'm going to make a couple of observations, and I'm going to drill in on the euro, and and I want I want you all to see this. Um, because I think it's important. First, first of all, when you're looking at the euro, probably the one characteristic of this chart that stands out to me more than anything is that we didn't make a new low in this most recent move. You, you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's right. We in, instead of you know pushing below parity, we held above parity. Now that lack of follow through to the downside is now going to become a risk to a potential move to the upside. Now, as, as I've mentioned to you guys for the last, you know, few days, um, you know, I do think that stocks are going to continue higher. I know, you know, sentiment is extremely bullish and probably too extreme, but, Look, we had one day of a pullback, and that was yesterday. And uh, and now we now that we've had one day of a pullback, maybe we can have another ten days of straight up in equities, right? I'm it's joking. also a great look, uh, Blake. It's a five year base of accumulation uh, of the the euro. Euro, yeah, five, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to 2015, yeah, it started. Yeah, I mean it's it's huge, right? And so, yeah. um, look. I'm looking at the euro at this point. Here's the, uh, this is the daily chart. So with the daily chart, let's draw something a little different here. 
Okay. There's your trend line, right? Uh, and that, that's going to this last spike high back in, uh, in, in March. Now, as you can see, we are slightly above that as of right now. The bullish momentum is, you know, is is here with the euro, and now I think the risk is that that we get a move above, you know, the highs that we that we posted in March, and make a move for the. Uh, I didn't know I I need a different tool here. Give me one second, and we make a move for potentially 117, maybe even higher than that, closer to 120. Um, you know, I know that the moves are pretty extended right now, but this is very impulsive and and it's, and it's you gotta respect that. Um, you know, I've been trying to buy the Euro on dips uh, and I was hoping this week to, to get a dip. When we dip below 112.50, I was really hoping that we get a dip back down towards 111.80. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. I had bids out at 111.80. I thought we could reach all the way down to 111.50 if I was lucky early this week. Just there's no dice because what's happening is equities are are too strong. So as equities are too strong, the dollar is going to stay weak. But you know, obviously that changes if equities become really weak and the dollar starts to reverse its course is today the possible day that that could happen absolutely it is absolutely i don't think it's going to be i don't think i don't think the euro is going to reverse course today but today is the day if it's going to do it today's the day right um and and i say that because it's fomc day if if the Fed, uh, you know, announces some sort of shift in policy today, that could be what turns the market, and we could see, you know, the the uh, the euro turn back towards one twelve. We could see stocks pull back a little bit, but knowing what you guys know about the Fed. Do you think the Fed is more likely to kill the market or is the Fed more likely to light some more fuel for the fire? Well, Fed likes a weak dollar. What do you think? Fed Fed likes a strong stock market. Right. And Fred, the, the Fed dollar. knows that uh, the, yeah. the way to, the path to full employment is uh, one of the key components is keeping equities elevated. I think, right? Yeah. So, and the dollar's you know. easy sacrificial lamb, right? The least noticeable by the public and everything, uh, the dollar weakens. Sure, and or yeah. anything else. Yeah, I mean, so look, uh, the, the the could the could the dollar reverse course day? Sure, it could, and it could start to bounce, and we could start to see stocks sell off. I don't know if I'd bet against the Fed today. Right. And and I think that anybody who is buying the dollar at this point is holding on for dear life and ready to close everything today. Does that make sense? Like I, you know, it's like, OK, I'm short the euro right now. I'm just using that as an example. I'm short the euro. And and if it breaks out above 114, I've got to get out. Period. End of story. Right. That's just that's it. I can't, you know, after the Fed today, if the Fed doesn't signal that they're going to change policy and I just have to close my shorts. So that that could be the the factor that actually drives us to 116. You know, uh, it's quite possible. So the the thing is, is I think we got to be very careful here. You know, uh, Greg had a great play in the, the, the cable right up to 128. And actually, yeah. He, it went to 128.02 was the high. He got limited out, and there's a 78% retracement right here. But also note that there's, you know, a downtrend line that comes in around 128.50. So, you know, if the euro does break 114, I'm assuming the cable is going to continue higher. There's also other currencies that we need to pay attention to, like look at the Aussie. He could right have gotten 802. We're going to have to punish him. What? 
he could have gotten filled to 2802. No, he would have been. <laughs> he was wrong on the target by two pips. He, he could have. What's wrong yeah. with him? Right. Got to clean he it up. He's not, he's, just, he's not very good. He's needed to polish his skills a little bit. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, look at the Aussie. I mean, the Aussie's getting to that, that squeeze area, you know, where we could really start breaking above 170, uh, 50, you know, Kiwi is as well. I mean, the, 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 uh, the pullbacks are very minimal. Uh, the dollar Canadian, I mean, the dollar Canadian is actually holding up pretty well, but that doesn't mean that that's going to last, you know, the, the dollar Mexican post peso remains below 22. Um, the U S dollar Swiss franc, this is, I mean, if it's going to hold at the 618 and the 161% extension of this move, this is where it's going to hold. But, you know, if this breaks, you know, the, the Swissy could be trading down at 93 cents. Uh, you know, the US dollar Norwegian Krona is above this channel uh, as we had an outside day yesterday. And it's trying to base here right at these lows. But, you know, if we break through 917, you know, we're going to give back more of these, you know, uh, reverse more of this move um the dollar yen you know we we had this inverted head and shoulder pattern we broke the uh broke the the neckline and you know here here we are dumping i mean the dollar yen which thank goodness i pulled it off uh at, at 108 uh 109.55 because uh and that was the previous 618 because now looking at the dollar yen i mean if this dollar continues you know, dollar yen could be trading right back down, you know, towards the 104, 103 level before turning. So I'm just, what I'm trying to showcase here is the, the dollar is vulnerable. You know, the dollar is very vulnerable. And I think that if you are uh, long the dollar, you know, today is the day where you go, okay, you know, it's really got a reverse course today. And if it doesn't reverse course today, uh, I, I've got to close. I got to close my positions, and I think that's that's probably what most traders are that that are trading the dollar are probably thinking right now. Is today is do or die, right? It's do or die, and and I think a lot of people are trying to lean into this uh, lean into this um, move to buy dollars. But the, the fact of the matter is, is if you take the equity markets and you take the S and P that continues to 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 hold on to its gains, the Nasdaq continues to break out. I mean, I told the I told our traders in our chat room yesterday, you, you can't fade risk while the while the Nasdaq's breaking out. You just can't. You can't. You can't. You know. I mean, I know there's sector rotation probably going to happen at some point, but you know, if, if you've got the the typical leaders in the market like the Nasdaq continue to break out. It's really difficult to 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 try to trade against it. Now, by the end of the week, if the Nasdaq slumps back, and this is the Nasdaq 100, we slump back below 9,800. You know, then then I think it's a open invitation to be on the short side of some of these uh, some of these other other indices. But as of right now, as of where it stands, you guys have to be very very careful. Um, you know, being short equities as everybody's chasing. Plus we got the FOMC today and, um, you know, uh, we have the, the FOMC today and, you know, with, unless the Fed signals some sort of major change in the way they're going to, uh, to um, uh, deal with monetary policy, which probably will not be the case. And I doubt they're going to, they're going to uh, try to rock the boat here. And as everybody's been pointing out, you know, the, that moral hazard that they've created, I mean, how do they, how do they back that up? How do they reverse that? They don't. Well, there, there, there it is, Steve. They don't, right? There is, no, there is absolutely no way they can do it. That's why they keep doubling down in what they do. I mean, I was saying yesterday, Blake, and, you know, I've said it multiple times in the past, Bernanke was saying that, you know, whatever they did in the financial crisis of 2008 was temporary and they would unwind it once the emergency was over. Since they didn't manage to do that after the longest expansion period in the history of the US, how exactly can they unwind triple that? Because they've already gone to double that within, you know, what is it, like a few months. So I think that even the most naive 
person cannot really believe that there is an exit strategy. There isn't. Yeah. So, so with, with that being said, I mean, you know, what happens next? Do, do equities continue to go into new highs? Because that's what I assume is going to happen here. The only break in what they're doing is the value of the dollar. So the only barrier in, uh, that, will, uh, that will put an end to what they're doing is when printing is so much uh, and the circumstances are uh, such that, um, uh, you know, they will just end up printing money that has very little value. And that will uh, force them to put an end to that. Now, the unfortunate part is that when the market forces uh, make them stop, the conditions are going to be the absolute worst to do that because you either make the right choice in time and you take the pain, uh, but at least, you know, it's manageable. Or, you know, if, if you get to the point that you're forced to stop doing that, uh, you know, the timing is always the worst possible one. Uh, yeah. But it's all a game of pushing the problem down the future and hoping that it's not going to explode in your hands because it's in essence a hand grenade, right? I mean, you right. took the pin off and now you're just hoping that, you know, it's it's going to be at someone else's hands that it's going to blow up. Bernanke, uh, you know, had the luck of, you know, doing that successfully. Same thing happened with Yellen. Uh, Powell is hoping that he's going to manage to do the same. Um, but you know how it is. You know, the end is inevitable. The when is the only question mark. Hey guys. Yeah, which, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, Marcin in our chat room said, it posted this chart about, you know, throughout the centuries, uh, what currencies, um, you know, held the mantle of, uh, of reserve currency. Right. And it, you know, went back to 1400 and, you know, talked about, you know, whether it was Portugal or the UK and now it's the United States for the last 95 years or whatever it is, whatever it's been. Um, and, and, you know, the question is, well, when, when is that going to change? When's the dollar, you know, not become the reserve currency? And, and my, my opinion is, yeah, it's probably going to be sometime in my lifetime. Yeah, but, it is. It but, is probably going to be. In but but, but is, it, is it today? Is it tomorrow? Probably not. You know, is that going to change? Yeah, the these are tomorrow? slow processes. Yeah, it, it, it is. But, um, but it's interesting because, you know, you look at, you look at the, the, the euro and where the dollar is at. I, and I, and I, and I get, again, I have to go back over to, you know, the big weekly chart for the euro dollar is, is just observe the fact that we haven't hit new lows and on a weekly basis. And Dale made a great, observation look it's five years of building a base in the euro um you know it, you know and i and i had long argued if you guys remember uh the last few months uh, and actually even towards the end of last year i'm like look i can see the euro trading back into the teens um you know pretty easily and this would be towards the end of last year the beginning of this year before covid right really be, took hold um, you know, as we were trading these levels, I'm like, yeah, I could see it, you know, trading up into the teens, not too much of an issue, but now that we're here and given the fact that we made a new low and didn't, um, you know, didn't build on that a couple months ago, now the risk is for, you know, to trade probably into the high teens closer to 120. I think that that's more of a realistic expectation nowadays, especially based on what the Fed's done. Unless, unless, and the, the real, the, the big caveat here is unless stocks reverse course. And if stocks reverse course from current levels, um, the dollar will come in demand. I do believe that the dollar as a reserve currency will be a, uh, uh, you know, always come in demand whenever that the market is, um, um, concerned about holding anything else uh, that that will always be the case, but not necessarily today. Do we have data? We have data coming out right yeah, now, right? In eight yeah. seconds, Blake, CPI oh, data. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yep. Hi, everybody. Hey, hey. Stelios. Are you, are you in the boat? I am waiting to board, but, uh, oh, here we go. 
minus zero point one versus zero point zero expected. Uh, 1.2 versus 1.3 expected, so slightly worse than expected, but nothing to write home about. Yeah, yeah. Dollar yen's come under a little bit of pressure, but you know, I mean, this is a one-minute chart. Don't get too, yeah. don't get too terribly excited about about that. Um, all right. Well, I, you know, Stelios, it's nice to nice to hear you. I know you've uh, you've you've enjoyed a couple of days away. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to to both of you guys and uh, and Dale. So. Um, Remember, if you guys haven't tried out Forex Analytics, make sure you do so. And uh, it's only a dollar. Give it a whirl. All right. Um, Steve Stelios, I'll Thank pass it over to you. Good luck. Today, Thank you, mate. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Good luck to you. You know, guys, I agree 100% with what you said, Steve. They, the Fed can't get out of this. But no, no chance. I've been, saying, I've been saying for a few weeks now, I think we have one more leg lower. And I think, you know, I think the catalyst is going to be the fact that the Fed always makes the same mistakes. Remember what they did with their attempt to quanti uh, quantitative tightening uh, in 2018. Uh, they merely began to do something and the market just crapped the bed. I think because they will always try, at least, you know, show some willingness to try and unwind, I think they might at some point say, look, I think we're going to, uh, you know, stocks are near all time highs again. The global economy seems to be going back up and opening up slowly. Is there a reason for us to have these ridiculous monetary easing? There is a reason, but they, they might argue against it. And that, that, I think, is what the market might take as a signal that they might reverse a little bit. And that's all we need for a leg lower in equities. I think that's, uh, you know, it's my prediction that this is gonna, what's going to happen. Do I think equities are going to be lower, you know, years from now? Of course not. You know, just by inflation and, and the Fed's balance sheet growing every year is going to drive equities higher. But I think there will be a leg lower. And I've said this. I know I've, I know I've been wrong for the past two weeks, but um, I think uh, I think it's coming. And today's FOMC, you know, might, might be the catalyst. Be yeah. If they might, express might any be. type, if they express any type of uh, uh, conservatism in quotes, of course, <laughs> having yeah. to do, you know, with uh, the path forward of monetary policy, like if the point to perhaps some slowing down of this madness or if they uh, photograph a possible um, uh, yeah. situation that they're monitoring the stock markets uh, being frothy, you know, or whatever. I think that, yeah, that might yeah. be the catalyst. How about another uh, spike in COVID? <clears throat> Cases are still going up in California. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, a that's a possibility. We are having, a, you know, cases are going up here in Greece. Uh, because we opened up the, the economy and, the, you know, we took lockdown out. And I'm reading in other places. I read an article about uh, Arizona. Yeah. I should know this. Um, so, you know, it's unavoidable that as we open up, there's going to be more cases. Now, what happens? You know, how much um, of an effect does that have? You know, we could have local lockdowns. This is what they're discussing here in Greece. If you see a, an area where there's a spike, yeah. you lock down Hot that spots. area. Yeah. Exactly. So... You know, I don't know. The OECD today, they um, revised, they said that we're going to have a 6% decline in global GDP. And they said that if we have another spike in cases, it's going to be 7.6%. I, I highly disagree with that. If it's 6%, the base case, and we have another spike, it's going to be much more than that. Yeah, but, it's not going to go from my, minus 6 to minus 7. Point, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be exactly. much worse. I agree. <laughs> So, you know, this is something we have to look at. And so that, I think things. that's the only thing that could override uh, whatever the Fed is doing. I agree, yes. Okay, I agree. so, I mean, and, and we are starting to get reports, like you said, Arizona's out of control. And, yeah. uh, and uh, especially consider Arizona is a place that is not uh, densely populated, and it's a freaking desert. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, the weather Phoenix definitely... is huge. Yeah, the, the, Metalopolis. Yeah, and, and the weather definitely doesn't, um, um, you know, make it easier, you know, for infections to spread, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, I, you know, I, I remain with this view. Obviously, there will be a catalyst at some point. What will it be? I don't know. There's a friend who's asking if I'm still short s and I'm short a very small position, yes, and I'm underwater. I am long silver and short euro Norway, as, uh, though. So that's... I hope you're long Tesla and uh, Nikola as well, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm not Nikola. Yeah, <laughs> um, so you know, overall, they, I'm, have, you, have know... you seen have you seen the stock, Nikola? No, I haven't. No. Uh, the, no, this I haven't. is this is a company actually. I mean, 
they're going to be writing books about their stuff. I'm, I'm going to have to be explaining to my son what was yeah. happening during these years. Oh, so I, this is a I, stock of a company that yeah. will be building electric, uh, electrical trucks. Yeah. It has sold zero. Yeah. It has made zero revenue ever. Yeah. Ever. And it now has the market capitalization of Ford. Ford, oh. yeah. yeah. It's uh, crazy. Yeah. Why don't we they go have, public? They haven't even sold. They haven't even sold a, a, a miniature truck for children. Yeah, <laughs> and they're worth as much as Ford. Not to mention the example of Tesla, which is like you know the biggest scam ever. I mean, <laughs> as I've said before, I, I think that Tesla at some point is probably going to be bought off by some other company, you know, for a fraction of the value. Yeah. Um, I was looking yesterday out of curiosity. So Tesla has a market capitalization of 175 billion. Volkswagen, which has Volkswagen, Audi, uh, Skoda, and Seat, has a market capitalization of 75. Daimler, which makes Mercedes, has a market capitalization of 42. And BMW of 38. In combination, those three mega companies have a market capitalization that is 20 billion less than Tesla. Now, those three giant companies have had a 2019 revenue of 530 billion and Tesla 25. I mean, you know, uh, there is not much to be said, and you you see you see you know all these all these distortions in the market are insane, insane. I mean, as I said, they're going to be writing books about these things. Stell, what else did you have? We might have lost him because he's on yeah. a Wi. He, he's on a four. Yeah. He's on a four G. Yeah, I'm three G signal over there. Okay. Uh, Nicola has. Uh, our friend here says Nicola has 1.5 million in cash on hand and zero orders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should go public. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, Dale, uh, any requests? Yeah. Where we where you want to start from? Uh, well, uh, Grega had this target at uh, 128. Do you think it's worth uh, anything counter trend here in cable? I think in general, we're going to see, you know, it's, it's this waiting game. I, I've talked about it, you know, for the past couple of weeks. It's a waiting game. Um, the dollar is uh, rather oversold in the short term and stocks are extremely overbought in the short term. So buying... Uh, or selling the dollar here because we know that these things are very much coupled with each other now. Um, you know, buying stocks here makes zero sense and there is no risk reward. So you need to see some type of a decent pullback to do so. Same deal with the dollar. Since we know that the pullback in the risk will get the dollar bid, uh, you know, it's, it, it's this annoying environment that unless you are already participating, I mean, I have a position in USD knock in, in Euronoc, which are working nicely. I'm, I'm short stocks. I'm out of the money in that, which is okay with me because I had built a cushion being long in order for me to do that. I, I admit that I, you know, I was, I was really believing that it's going to turn, you know, earlier, but, you know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm still within the parameters that I had set, so I'm waiting in that as well. But if you're not participating one way or another, you know, you just have to either start fading these moves slowly just by building a position or if you want to wait for confirmation, which I totally understand, you just have to, uh, you know, wait for a signal. What, what would be an initial signal? Um, you know, it always starts with a big reversal day. Now, it's, it's going to be a good opportunity if that can also come with a catalyst behind it. So let's assume that the Fed sparks some kind of a reversal today based on some statement they make or... Uh, some some change in outlook they make or tapering off perhaps expectations of uh, you know monetary um, easing or whatever else. So for example, if today that proves to be the catalyst and and you see some daily closes that you know point to a decent reversal, then uh, you know 
uh, you can start looking for at least a counter trend move and keep in mind we are overextended meaning you know a counter trend move in in, all, in any of these uh, markets uh, can be can be very decent um, so you know same deal here with the cable I mean if we see a risk going off the dollar is going to go bid uh, you know I would be looking for the following levels as a as a pullback area for the cable. One of them is 126.40, that double top high that we had over there. And most importantly, probably what the 125.50 area, which is back here. So I, I, at the very least, personally, I would be looking for a retest of the 125.50 area. Um, having to do with the Euro, and it's worth having to do with the Euro going on the uh, four hour chart and I'll show you why because the euro is following very nicely this ascending channel on the four hour chart so having to do with the euro um, probably this is a wave five you can clearly distinguish one two three four five right so I would expect rather soon a pullback now the question you know how deep of a pullback at the very least a revisit of 112.40 I mean at the very very least if not that, 111.50 uh, is the next area of interest. And as I've shown on the daily chart, 110.60 is also no doubt of the question. Now, you know, I, I, I think attempting to buy a decent pullback, uh, we drew this a long time ago. We've already overshot, but you know, my general expectation of how it would move remains the same, meaning I was expecting, you know, a breakout from there would produce an extension, then a pullback, uh, then a continuation higher. So the expectations are still the same, but you know this um, this extension following that breakout um, proved to be uh, you know bigger. So perhaps the pullback is a little bit smaller. Perhaps we pull back to 111.70. Um, having to do with stocks, you know, clearly if you want to use, for example, the S&P, which is considered like the risk barometer, it has now reached perfect equality of wave one to wave five. Now, the fact that this move higher is in five waves would imply that uh, a pullback would be corrective. But keep in mind that even a corrective pullback, I mean, the very minimum target I would be looking for would be a revisit of this breakout area to 29.45. So at the very least, I would be looking towards that. And I would still find it rather likely to test levels like 2,800. Uh, even 2720, whatever that is. Okay. Um, now, you know, if that happens rather soon, we're also going to have the nice signal, which is going to be the divergence of the NASDAQ. Uh, I talked about that in advance, the possibility of the NASDAQ uh, perhaps producing an all-time high with the S&P not doing so before a pullback. Uh, so we already have you know, clearly an all-time high. I mean, we've been, this is the fourth day that we are above the previous all-time high that uh, we developed um, February 20th, the day that we actually reversed lower. Um, we've already seen this overthrow from this ascending wedge. It's very usual to see overthrows in ascending or descending wedges. So, you know, no, sur no surprise there. As you very well noted, and we've been saying for days, there is a clear divergence in the VIX. Um, so, you know, usually these end up playing out within a few days. Um, so, uh, you know, I still think that, you know, what, what you should be doing here is waiting uh, to finally see that type of reversal and, you know, choose which side you want to be on. You want to take advantage of that pullback. You want to just be waiting and then just buy, you know, pullback. Um, uh, any pullback you've seen in risk assets and sell again the dollar, uh, you know, at any decent rebound. Speaking of the dollar, if we assume that we've seen the high, I'm skeptical about it yet. Uh, I think that the market, you know, that likes to inflict the maximum uh, amount of pain might produce another high. But in any case, I think we, we might see a retest of the 200 daily moving average at 98.50. So you know, something like this. Okay. Uh, similarly, of course, and I don't want to, I don't need to go over it. Um, 
Aussie, Kiwi, and all those commodity currencies should uh, produce, um, you know, uh, a decent sell-off uh, following any um, turn lower in risk. So, you know, nothing has changed there as well. Let me go through some of the questions. Uh, do you not have a bullish view on USD Yen too? Uh, that was for Blake, judging by the timestamp that, that was going for Blake. Uh, I'm not sure what Blake's stance is at the moment. You know my personal stance. I'm staying the hell away from USD Yen and thankfully, because I, you know, if I wanted to actually trade this, I would probably have lost a lot of money because we've been seeing false breakouts in, in either direction again and again and again and many false starts. So in my opinion, the best thing you can do about the USD Yen is stay as far away as you can from it. Um, would the USD card do a similar bearish move compared to the Euro USD? No, Euro USD and USD card, I wouldn't say they are like outside of the USD component, which of course, you know, creates a correlation, but you know, the Euro and the card between them, you know, don't share many characteristics. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't really, you know, uh, try to equate them in any way. But if you want my view, for example, in USD CAD, my view is that USD CAD might have already bottomed here in the short term. If not, we might see a little bit lower, like towards 133. And I would expect a rebound from there, you know, at least a decent rebound from there um, to follow. Of course, that's going to coincide with any risk of move that, you know, will take place. A uh, question about natural gas and zinc. Uh, can you please give me a ticker for zinc? I'll be more than happy to have a look at natural gas. So listen, um, I I've said it before. It's clear here that natural gas is trapped within the range. That's the 150, roughly 150, a little bit higher than that, to $2 range. Now, you can either trade the range so, you know, today at the lows, probably it was a decent buying opportunity. We were getting closer, you know, to the bottom of the range. Or you can wait for a breakout. Personally, I would only be buying a breakout to the upside because I think that even if we see a break to the downside, it's going to be short-lived and limited. Uh, so I do think that the next big move for natural gas, whenever that happens, is going to be to the upside. But that doesn't mean that it has to happen imminently, right? I mean, we might spend more time consolidating in this range. Okay. Uh, Euro is perky, 115. Here we come. Yeah, we might get there first, but I would expect some type of a pullback before we can continue higher, as, as I already indicated earlier. If we can close above 84 today, uh, 84, uh, uh, 84 in what instrument? Um, Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Da, 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 da. Target now. I want to complain. If I, okay. Questions about gold and silver. So, you know, at least you need to be cognizant of the fact that I've warned you not to keep losing your money in trading the USD yen and not to try to be short gold and silver. So, gold still in a consolidation here. I see nothing bearish with this chart yet. Yes, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously noticing uh, momentum divergences. There's no question about it. But we've had momentum divergences, I mean, you know, since we were trading $200 lower. So, you know, if you were just trying to make money in the short side based, you know, purely on momentum divergences, you're probably in the poor house already. Uh, so... What I see here in gold is likely consolidation. What I see in silver so far is likely consolidation again. So, I mean, you know, in my opinion, you're either along or you're looking to get long at lower levels whenever we get a pullback. Um, you can make money counter trend as in any uh, case, but, you know, making money here counter trend is going to prove quite tricky. As, to be honest, it's proving tricky to make money uh, counter trend in stocks, but at least, you know, if you were trying to short stocks based on the previous move lower, it made sense to believe that the trend has switched to lower while having to do with gold, especially the trend in gold has clearly changed since gold broke through 1360. And that was a long time ago. So, 
you know, it's, I don't really know why so many people are trying to fade gold when it's not only that it has produced, you know, a major technical move, but most importantly, it is also in an environment that fundamentally speaking is as ideal as it can be for monetary metals. There's a question, is Forest Park on our site? Yes, we are uh, cooperating with Forest Park FX very, very closely. Uh, this is our homepage. If you go to the reimbursement program, you can find the Skype button here and an email button there where you can contact them uh, Dale already mentioned you, what you can do with them. What he forgot to mention is that you don't even need to create a new account. If you are at a respectable broker that they're working with, you can add them as your intro introductory broker without even having for you to make a new account or whatever. And starting that day, you're going to start getting back part of the um, uh, part of the revenues uh, the uh, brokerage firm makes from your trading, uh, you know, you're going to get part of them back. So, you know, it's a win-win situation. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some decent cashbacks uh, by being with them and there is literally no downside. Uh, good morning, good morning, good luck. Yes, uh, let me see, burn all the strong markets, weak USD is good for trade. Uh, the thing is that when USD really turns lower, it's going to turn a lot lower. So dollar to 50. Uh, to begin with, my, my prediction since months ago, pre-coronavirus was that within a period of a couple of years, we were going to see dollar 30% lower. So my prediction remains the same. Uh, will gold continue to rise under the current environment? Yes, nothing moves in a straight line uh, and there is no certainty in the markets, but under the current environment, the chances are overwhelmingly in, in favor of gold. Um, sorry, going through the question, XPT USD. So question about platinum, let's have a look at it. So here is platinum. Uh, you know, this has started looking like a consolidation, clearly. So that was an imp a pivot area, as indicated, and I wasn't wrong about that. But let's do some redrawing here. Um, so let's redraw here. This is, until proven otherwise, likely another bullish consolidation. So we might end up seeing that break above 875, which I think is going to be a major development in platinum. Now, against 875, it's not a good idea to try to be long because it's a major area of resistance. Uh, but needless to say, um, you know, passing through 875, uh, when that happens, uh, I think that's going to be a major bullish signal. FX Trader says Tesla is like Bitcoin, same market cap, so what is cheaper? <laughs> Risk-free returns are evidently a God-given right, and I thought the dot-com era was insane. Yeah, as it seems, we're building an era that will make dot-com, if it continues like that for a few more months, it will make the dot-com bubble uh, make, like a uh, make, make it look like a walk in the park. Uh, I think uh, Steve had mentioned a daily close of 30 to 60 areas, a place he might cover his short. That is still the case. Yes. Uh, no, uh, that's exactly you remember very correctly. Um, DJ says instances like this, uh, Nikola activity isn't a good amb ambassador for equity markets. Examples like this, uh, and then the public distrust. Uh, undermining the free capital markets credibility. That's a problem that in, in essence, they, they've destroyed free markets. Ozyen, Euro, Kiwi. Okay, let's have a look at those. Uh, so I agree with you, mate. Uh, that's a huge problem, actually. So here is the Ozyen. Quite a big reversal from a key area of resistance. Uh, perhaps, let me overlay the S&P here, for example. Uh, 
Let me make it a different color. Uh, let's make it yellow. So here is the OGN, here's the S&P. Um, you know, quite a nice rejection from there while the S&P seems to have stabilized. Uh, so I would say, be a little bit careful. That might be an early indication that the S&P is going to turn lower as well. Having said that, next area of support, keep in mind, is this 7240 area. Okay. Now, um, we also had a question about Euro Kiwi. I showed yesterday the Euro Aussie. Here is the Euro Kiwi. Now, this is another divergence uh, similar to what we saw in the, uh, in the VIX. Uh, nice outside uh, white candlestick yesterday in the Euro Kiwi. Keep in mind that Euro Kiwi has a very tight correlation, inverse correlation with risk. So quite a formidable reversal higher yesterday. Um, that might also be another indication that markets might be about to find a short term top. Keep in mind that when we see a risk off, you should expect more upside, both from Euro Aussie and Kiro, Euro Kiwi, pound Aussie, pound Kiwi as well. Okay. Uh, wonder if USD Yen is the canary in the coal mine. I think you should stop paying much attention to USD Yen because it's going to do more harm than good. Used to be, yes, but it's now on a world of its own. It's following more closely yields during the past few days, admittedly. So, you know, if you want to talk about the USD Yen, here is the USD Yen. And let me show you. Let me first not forget to. Okay. So here's the USD Yen. Let's add. US 10. So you see there is a divergence, but if we zoom in, you see, you'll see that the short term price action, you see, these are the 10 year yields. Let me make this yellow again. Okay. So you see yellow, let me make it thicker. Okay. So you see yellow is the 10 year yield. And you have the USD yen. So you see that it's a much tighter correlation with the yield now, right? Actually, it's always been, but in the past, yields were very nicely correlated with risk. They've now decoupled uh, quite a lot. Uh, your thoughts on nickel, aluminum, palladium? Listen, uh, from those, I've only been trading palladium on occasion, and I was lucky quite successfully, I have to say. I've made, during the past year, quite a lot of money from palladium. Actually, one of some of my best trades were here. In the short term, you know, this is some type of a consolidation here. Now, God knows what type of a consolidation, because the problem with consolidations is that you know, you need the more price action you get, the better idea you get of what type of consolidation you have. Um, so, you know, not a good place to trade it because it's it's not that clear. Uh, generally, it's decently correlated with risk on occasion, though. I mean, more more usually than not. Um, copper due to retrace. Yeah, actually, copper. Uh, you know, quite surprisingly, copper sliced through that area of resistance like it wasn't there. And that is probably a bullish development. Um, you know, next area of resistance is this channel. Fed I saved have to... us, man. Fed saved us. <laughs> yeah. Dr. <laughs> Copper's telling us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Having said that, be a little bit careful here because now the RSI is like at 75. We're approaching this channel of resistance. So, you know, in the short term, I, I think that, you know, you should be a little bit careful here. Dr. Copper. Do we have an interview, by the way, today, uh, yes. Dale? Yes. Uh, ben do we have? Maldonado. Ah, okay. I'm not sure, Ben, if you're here, will you raise your hand? I see uh, Another ben question here about Euro e Pound. E -N -N. Is that you? Euro Pound was in a range. Okay. It, it broke through the range. And guess what? It's now in another range. This range has support being the previous range's resistance. And the resistance being roughly, let's say, just above 90 cents. So not much to do here. 
I mean, in order for you to, to be sure that it makes sense, you know, you need to see it clear through 8850 or alternatively clear through 9020 in order for you to be long. But in the short term... A lot of indecision. Yeah, a lot of indecision. Here. Exactly, exactly. But in the short term, it looks like you should be looking elsewhere. I mean, you know, find something else to trade. Uh, Usually all those indecision patterns across different instruments imply that you're near an inflection point. Yeah, usually that's the case. Think? Yeah. Here is zinc, but no. Uh, any CFD because this has like... Mm, I can't decide if I like you or Stelios more. I'm having a hard time with it. <laughs> Call my counselor today. Yeah, I know a lot of price action, so I can judge. If you find any type of continuous... Oh, zinc's good for your prostate. And it is? And fighting COVID. Okay, how, how do I insert it? Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you oh, mean suppositories. Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm out of that game now. <laughs> Painfully, Ben says. No, he has a little Vaseline, buddy. DJ. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I'm dry. getting. Uh, yeah, I know I'm getting long because the doctor told me now. Now that I'm forty, I'm like, I was like, you know, do oh. I need to start making any new exams? And and he was like, you know, we can have a first look at your prostate and yeah. you know your colon in five years from now. And I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound that far away anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it won't be. It what happens is it turns it from a size of a little nut to a grapefruit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll yeah, leave the something details. to look forward to for a medical show. Yeah. Uh, for the time being, and for another two days, I'm not even forty. So you okay. know, somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah, and you're really in. It, uh, Anyway, I won't even say what I'm thinking. Anyway, Ben's here. Should we bring okay, him on? Okay, enjoy. What a good segue for Ben. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ben. Please save us from this, okay? Yeah, indeed. Save us from ourselves. <laughs> okay, Ben. Should be coming up there. I'm unmuting you. I'm asking to unmute. You see your microphone, buddy? You unmute now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I love Got it you, too. Ben. All right. I had How a good, laugh, good laugh listening to you guys how's this your, morning. Before we get going <laughs> about shorting the S&P, how's your prostate? Uh, <laughs> as, far, as far as I know, all, all is well. All right. So uh, that's our support group for this for the day. So ben, uh, if you know how to share, it's yep. a green box. Let's and do that. Um, I'm real interested in uh, picking up on your narrative of the '70s. I'm trying to remember: would uh, social unrest, uh, the Vietnam War protests, were happening during Nixon? Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there will will. We'll, this is sort of the outline we're going to cover today. The first okay. thing we'll do is we'll uh, we'll go Let's over. Share this. it though. I I still can't see your screen. You can't see it? No. You click the one. There's a second on. screen that's going to come up once you click. That will ask yeah, you which screen you want to share, and I then did. you have to click again. Yeah. Let me see. I did that, but let's try it again. Oh, we'll click again. Got you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. There you go. There we go. Now we can see you. Thanks, yep. Steve. Okay. So. It will, will, it, the analog is definitely on our on our list today to, to review. We'll go over some of that. There's a few new instances that have come up that that you know confirm and and reinforce the the correlation. We'll also go over another sort of bigger cycle that's an epic cycle, a 400 year cycle that'll give us sort of a a 10,000 foot view of the bigger picture, the background weather that we're operating in and. And because a lot of people are wondering, you know, why is why is the world falling apart? Why is this craziness going on? And this cycle gives us a little clue there. What what is uh, uh, the definition, or what was it? Who was that cycle named after? What's epoch? Epoch means a long period of time. Okay. So, 
so that's that's it's four it's a 400 year cycle it's not it's not named after anyone or you okay. know, no, nobody found it or anything like that okay. so but let's let's go right into the uh to the 70s analog we've been talking about this and dale you and i've been talking about this for over a year now where the cycles that we're currently going through have a connection to the ones in the 70s and i listened to andy's talk on monday and he was he was showing the the connection was through the 45 year cycle, which is half of the 90 year cycle. So we're connected right now to the events that happened in, in 1929 and the events that happened in the mid seventies. Um, I've focused in on the mid seventies um, because I can, I can correlate the events that were happening now with events that happened back then very clearly. And some of, them, all of these. Yeah, some yeah. of them are up here on the board. The check marks we've talked about before, the ones below, and isn't it interesting that the, the fang is going on steroids now, that the concentration in, this, in these top four or five tech stocks or, or half a dozen tech stocks is getting worse. It's getting yeah. more concentrated. And, and for anyone that was around in the 70s, there was the Nifty 50, which – Every, every manager had to have in their portfolio, and, and that ended fairly badly. Um, obviously, since the last time we spoke, we spoke in early, early March, and the, the issues with the virus were just beginning to come to the fore. So I went back and I was researching and seeing, you know, was there a connection to anything in the 70s that could be similar? And believe it or not, there was, there was a swine flu outbreak that happened at Fort Dix in New Jersey that created a tremendous scare on a national level. Uh, there were, there were fears of a pandemic. Um, the leadership of the country, the Ford administration was so concerned that they developed a plan to vaccinate the entire country. They wanted the whole country, everybody in the country to get vaccinated, all 200 million people. Well, they got about 40 million of the 200 million vaccinated, there were was, problems with that vaccine, weren't there? It, it killed 25 people, uh, oh, 20, okay. and there was Only no 25. pandemic. Right. There, there were issues like side effects and other yeah, problems. Paralysis and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, some major health issues came out of that, and no pandemic appeared. So there was a, a tremendous um, Loss public of health credibility took a tremendous yeah. hit there. Um, yeah. That, that, that I, I take as being another hit on what's what we're going through today versus what happened in the 70s. Could I just add something? Because a friend of mine did, is doing sure. a comparison between COVID and uh, as swine flu was H1N1, right? Wasn't it the same one? Or was that a different one? I think that's a different one, but I'm not certain. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, there's a big dip uh, in August where people think, you know, it goes up in June and then a big dip in august but then it doubled from the first wave wow and um i don't know someone sent me a chart on the pandemic from 1917 18 and the first wave looks like nothing and the magnitude of wave two the magnitude is more than double that's all i could say so right. all right so there's a swine flu thing yeah, let's go to the next one. The social unrest you mentioned, obviously yeah. everybody's aware of what's happening currently. When I went back and was checking the 70s, uh, the Kent State protests and murder and uh, deaths occurred in, the, in 1970. Four students were killed. Uh, four protesting students were killed by the National Guard in Kent State right. in 1970. And then there was a, yeah. a one that I wasn't aware of, but which, which really connects to today is in Queens, New York, in both 1973 and 1974, there were riots and protests and, and a lot of social unrest when an undercover New York City police officer shot and killed a 10-year-old uh, black child, uh, a black boy who was running away, shot him in the back and killed him. Um, the officer was arrested, charged, and then acquitted. So when the, when the murder happened, there was rioting in Queens. And then when the acquittal happened, there was even worse rioting. So there, there is a connection with, with the social unrest and what's going on today. So, you know, I keep this in the, 
in the background and, and I'm constantly looking at current events and then saying, is there a connection with the seventies? Are we still, you know, sort of replaying in a different way, but in a connected way, are we still replaying these sorts of events from human perception and human emotions? And the answer rhyming. Yeah. Yeah. The answer continues to be yes. Let's go to the next slide. Um, in, in January, when, when, we were, when we got together and we were talking, I said there's, there's a few major trends that the cycles are calling for in 2020. Um, and these were the three broad categories I talked about. Um, in January, the market had been going up. Uh, and, you know, as you and Steve were talking about with the VIX, you guys were correct in saying, hey, you know, the VIX looks like a good buy here. There was no volatility. It was all just sort of grinding higher. Um, well, obviously, since then, we've had a tremendous amount of volatility. I think volatility is going to continue through this year and into the, into the, the near future. Um, and later in the presentation, we'll talk about a, a cycle that, um, that we're currently in, a window where um, there's a high, high probability we're going to see continued volatility, especially in the next 60 days. Okay. Um, inflation, stagflation was something we had spoken about. Um, we haven't seen inflation yet, um, and the stagflation obviously is going to take longer because it's related to growth and inflation, uh, but we're going to go through some, um, some data, and, and then I'll go through a few charts and show you why I feel like uh, the rationale uh, for uh, inflation is there. You have lots of money that's being created. Um, and lots of money chasing the same amount of goods or fewer goods is the definition of how you get inflation. Um, another reason why we should see inflation, governments are going to need to inflate away all this debt that they've created and all this um, global debt that's been created. An interesting one that I think um, a lot, a lot of people are talking about is reverse globalization. Um, one thing this pandemic has, has created is it's a desire in people to bring their supply chains back home. Now, how is that going to cause inflation? Well, the supply chains were offshored in the first place because it lowered costs. Cheaper labor. Totally. Cheaper labor, cheaper uh, materials prices. Everything was because things were cheaper, which kept inflation in check. If we bring these supply chains back home and the world starts bringing their supply chains back home, there's going to be higher costs. Um, yeah. The other thing that, that I think is beginning to play out and we're seeing is businesses are now trying to pass along the cost increases associated with the ways they have to do business now and the closings that they experienced. I don't know, I don't know if you saw it, Dale, but uh, in Chicago, about a month ago, restaurants were trying to put like a 25% COVID fee on, on to take out bills or carry out tabs. And people went crazy. They, 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 you know, all the consumers were saying, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to pay it. And they quickly pulled it back. But I think that's, that's a precursor to what you're going to start seeing. Businesses are going to start adding fees and charges because they need to, to survive. Order. Yeah, That's right. In order to survive, in order to be profitable, they need to do it. So, so that's another reason why we're going we're gonna to see inflation. Um, the cycles that I work with are, are pointing to an August to October timeframe of this year when we're going to begin to start seeing inflation. And we'll, we'll, we'll review a few charts to see um, what they're saying in terms of that. Are the cycles on track? Are there, are we, do we see any footprints of that? Um, the last area we, we talked about was commodities. We're going to go over charts of commodities because I think, um, I think you may have even shown this one time on one of your webinars about the, the ratio of, of commodities to stocks is at an all time low. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think these markets are in a position where they've been bottoming and basing for years and there's going to be a strong move in, in this area in the near future. I'm thinking next spring for the low on the grains. It may be. It may be. Um, and we'll go over the grain charts. I have some grain charts to look at. Um, here's our analog. Um, we've been following very, very nicely. Um, caught the high in, um, in February. Caught the low in March. Um, 
we've been wrong so far on this, on this turn. Um, being early is being wrong. So there's, there's no question. I'm early and I'm wrong on this. So how about the, magnitude? That surprised you too? The magnitude has, and I'll show you in the next slide, the magnitude has totally been off the charts. Because uh, the magnitude beyond, on this in the 70s was not comparable. No, it's completely benign compared to what we oh, just went through. Okay. And, and maybe that's why this move to the upside has been much larger than anticipated because the, the magnitudes are just, it's like it's on steroids now. There's, uh, yeah. there's no comparison. Okay. So this, this, based on time cycles, this is where we are. We are somewhere near this rebound peak after the initial low. And the, the rollover should come any time. And if the rollover gets going, the cycles are calling for new lows. I'm doubting we're, now that we're going to see new lows just because of the magnitude of the move higher. But again, that like you just said, it could be a function of this, the fact that the moves are um, multiples of what we, ex what we experienced in the 70s. So we'll have to see on that. Okay. In, in March, here's how we drew the perspective path. So we were, we were relative, we were, we were down but we weren't really down. The next slide will show you how it actually played out, but we were looking for a low shortly after March 10th, which time-wise did occur, and then a bounce, and then a re retrace uh, to, to lower lows. Here's where we are today. So we were here, essentially here, at that in Mar and March 10th. Right. We made the low, and now the bounce has come all the way back up here. Now, the time cycles, again, are calling for the next leg down. We're waiting. We're looking for evidence. We're looking for uh, confirmation to see if this analog continues to follow. If it doesn't, you set it aside and, and you do something else. As, as with anything, you got to get confirmation from the charts. You got to get confirmation in price. What number would give you that we're beginning to proceed back under the megaphone red line would that be uh that's about 3100 would that be a signal to you that's a signal and we'll go over a couple es charts where we're, we'll show levels where if oh, okay. we take out that support it'll give us uh it'll give us a good idea see that how patient going. i am <laughs> <laughs> so now let's now we're going to really test your patience because we're going to talk about a 400 year cycle um, Love these. The, the epic cycle is a 400-year cycle. Now, what, it, what, is, what is this cycle all about? You know, 400-year cycle, you can't trade. You can't trade a 400-year cycle. All you can do is, is be aware of it and then understand that things that are occurring are being affected by this cycle. So this epic cycle was all about building, like about creating these large centralized institutions to provide organization structure and support for society so they were they were things that were created that allowed for tremendous progress both scientific social progress um, as well as wealth accumulation and wealth building um, what we're seeing now is we're ending the we're entering the end of that cycle you know when you're talking about a 400 year cycle the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years is the end of the cycle. And what we've seen is, is we're entering a fragmentation phase where there's loss of trust and faith in these once revered institutions. So what we're seeing is people's belief in these institutions and their confidence in them, one by one, they're falling like pillars, they're coming down. Um, I put the, the, some of the major ones up there that people are, would, would easily be able to relate to. Religion, the problems with the Catholic Church is a perfect example. Uh, at one time, it was the most powerful and influential organization on the planet. And now uh, they're having trouble filling up churches. Uh, the media, I mean, everybody, everybody, this one is front and center now because of all the, the issues with fake news and all the other terms that are thrown out there. The media was once a revered institution. You watched the six o'clock news at night and, and you got the truth of what was going on. Now nobody yeah. believes what they're saying. No, there certainly are no Walter Cronkites out there. Nope, there are, there are none. Um, government is a category in, in and of itself. Um, faith in government is at an all-time low. 
Congress's approval ratings, the president. Now we're seeing institutions within, within the government themselves that are, that are losing credibility. The FBI, the NSA with all the Snowden revelations, the CIA with their, the, the black sites and the torture and the lying to create the, the justification for war. Most recently, and, and a trend we've seen in the last, last few years, is the police. Uh, and not not only the you know the heinous murders that or or killings that happen under their watch to to suspects or people they're interacting with, but that that civil a- asset forfeiture that they do, where they can take money that you have, even though there's no evidence of crime, no crime charged or nothing, they can just take money from you if you have cash in your vehicle or on your person. Um, it's those kinds of events that are helping to create this this lack of faith and lack of belief. Um, there's a few others in there. Obviously, we don't need to go into all of them, but but you can see that all of these sorts of institutions are having trouble retaining their credibility and retaining their influence over society and over the population. Um, What's happening next, a lot of people would think, oh my God, it's the end of the world. This cycle is it. They're going to destroy everything. It's not necessarily a a cycle of destruction. It's more of a cycle of evolution. We're going to be transitioning into more decentralized systems. Give an example. Yeah, I was going to say, we're already starting to see examples of it. And, And I'll give you an example. We live in a republic in the United States. California does things very differently than Texas. And it's not, they're not looking at, oh, we have to all do the same thing. We have to have a centralized government that gives us all the rules and all the ways we're going to do. And even within a state like California, there are areas where things are done differently. Orange County is very different than San Francisco in terms of how they run things. And we're going to see more and more of this fracturing and localization and and where people are not going to be relying on a central authority, but a more decentralized authority. I just saw one yesterday, which was which was incredible because it fits exactly exactly into this Antifa in Seattle. I, I saw the news yesterday. They have created an autonomous zone within the city of Seattle where they are going to be in charge with their own rules and the city is letting them do it. I think it's a six block area. You can check the news. It's incredible and it's hard to believe, but it's happening. So this is, this is the, the, the key thing about this. So, so how do we, oh, so we, you know, so uh, you're, you're saying then that things that Orwell and Huxley wrote about, about scientific dictatorships having complete control and new world order stuff is not happening here. It's the other way, fragmentation. Absolutely. And you know what it is, Dale? Think about this. At the end of a cycle, the, the, the existing cycle and the existing power structure does everything it can to maintain control. Yeah. It's like a sur- survival instinct, right? It's trying right. to maintain control and it's only getting worse. So we are, we are actually moving cycle-wise in the opposite direction than, than where the powers that be are trying to take us, which is more, more control, more power, more centralization. Well, they'll do the, they're not going to give up easy to and give no that way. up. Okay. <clears throat> Absolutely right, not. So where do we take this? Let, let's yeah. go. My, my, my thesis and question is, are central banks next? Are they the ones, is that institution going to start losing credibility? Is that institution going to start losing power? Is that institution going to start losing its, its ability to control things? Well, right now we know in the markets, it's all about the Fed and it's all about central banks. I, I can't tell you how many times a day I hear, don't fight the Fed or the Fed has your yeah. back or there's a Fed put. That's all we hear. That's and that's right. people's rationale and justification for investing because it's worked, right? It's, it's that recency bias. What happened in 2009? Everybody remembers that, right? The Fed came yes. in, they saved the day. If you bought everything, you made out like a bandit. And so people are using that same playbook and the liquidity tsunami that they have hit the markets with has worked so far, right? The markets are all up. Things are functioning. 
my question and my thesis is, is that effectiveness of this policy going to work? Is it going to fix the problems in the economy? Is it going to solve the solvency issues? Now, those are, well, those are major questions. Yeah, I see your list, and uh, they are failing in a few of them, like uh, velocity. Yeah, and we'll go over. I, I have the charts to look at. But the, 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 the caveat I will put on this, you will, you will get crushed if you try to fight the Fed directly. If you try to fight them directly, they will crush you in the short run. They have more money than you. You cannot outlast them. And, and this one that I put the, 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 the asterisks on here is, remember, the powers that be can change the rules of the game whenever they decide it's in their best interest. And, and remember, in, in, the, in the meltdown in March, in Europe, they banned short selling. They can change the rules at any time. So you always have to be aware of that. I have a 70s analog for you where that happened. Go ahead. During the Hunt Silver Squeeze, uh, the Comex changed their rules to liquidation only and uh, raised margins to um, force people out of their long positions. And that was the first trip to $50 silver in the late 70s. Yep. And that, that's a perfect that? example. Perfect example. And the There's 70s also. 70s, yeah. Nixon, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Uh, there you change a rule there. That was a big rule change. So note it, they will always do that when they can. Yeah. And so we, we have Bast to be aware of that. Those <laughs> bastards. <laughs> it doesn't mean we can't, we can't make money. It doesn't mean we can't find, you know, you wait till the giant is leaning over their toes and then you run up and push them in the back, right? You got, but you right. got to wait. You got to right. wait. So let's, let's go over a couple of these economic charts and see what's, what's going on with that. So here's Federal Reserve total assets. Everyone knows. They've, they've, jacked, they've jacked their balance sheet. Um, in 2007 to 2009, in the last crisis, we went from $890 billion to $2.2 trillion, or they added $1.3 trillion. Uh, in this cycle, they've gone from $4 trillion to $7.1 trillion. They've added $3.1 trillion to their balance sheet. So they have fired a bazooka. Uh, the money stock obviously responds to that. Uh, M2, which is um, cash, checking, time deposits, CDs, money markets, basically ready cash and cash equivalents has gone through the roof. So that's no surprise. Um, but as you mentioned, Dale, the velocity of money and the velocity of money is defined the, as the rate at which money is exchanged for goods and services. Is like, are people yeah. taking that money and spending it? Look at the difference in the velocity yeah. of money. Never seen it down here. Never. I mean, about you go back the to the 30s. Right. Maybe. Uh, maybe. You go back to the 70s, the 60s. This was all the data that the Fed sure. had on their website. But you can see it's gone down dramatically just from the last recession. Yeah. In, in the, the Great Recession. That's a problem with uh, growth, isn't it? It's showing Absolutely. that people are just it's sitting a on cash. It's a, well, here, here, let's see. Well, so what are, the, what are the consumers doing with their cash? Remember, this is important because consumer spending accounts for 68% of U.S. GDP. Yeah. 68%. So real personal consumption expenditures, which are um, basically consumer spending on goods and services on a national basis. Obviously, it's going to go down in the lockdown. So look at that. Look at that yeah. drop. Huge drop. So what, what are these consumers doing with their money? All, all this money the Fed created, all the money that people have, what are they doing with it? Well, look what happened to credit card debt. Down 60%. Yeah. They're paying off debt, which is a smart thing to do, right? If you're in a recession or if you're, if you're feared that you're not going to have a job, you want to you eliminate debt. So they're, they're, people are paying down debt. And that's reflected also in the personal savings rate. Look at the savings rate. Wow. So the consumer is not reacting to all this money in a similar way that they have in the past. Does that mean they're going to stop spending and we're going into a depression? Absolutely not. We don't know that. All we know is what they've done so far. And so far, it's different than in previous recessions, uh, especially the last one. Um, here's another interesting chart, and then we'll, we'll get into the, um, the charts on the commodities and stocks and everything. Um, this is credit card spending. 
This is Bank of America internal data. The thing that was most interesting to me about this chart is, is that even in the states where um, they're mostly open, online retail has stayed tremendously strong. Yeah. I mean, look, in uh, the mostly open states of Georgia, Arizona, and Florida, look at the percent change in online retail year over yeah. year. It stayed steady with the other states where obviously that's the only way they could shop. Again, look at the overall spending, though. It's not painting the picture of consumers that are just rushing out to buy everything they can. No. Uh, we'll have to see if it's, if it's a one data point or if it's a trend, because obviously with consumers being 68% of, the, of GDP, it's going to have a dramatic effect on how things, um, how things go in the economy and the growth. Uh, the first one we want to we talk about is the dollar. It's all about the dollar right now in, in terms of my work. And the reason being is the only way that they've been able to goose this stock market is with a weak dollar. Right. And if the dollar gets strong and if the dollar goes higher, um, this, you're going to see stock market weakness. If, they're, if they trash the dollar, we'll, we'll make new highs in the stock market. I mean, it's, it's been that it's, it's been, for me, it's been that pretty, pretty clear that that's, that's what's happening now. What's well, going to tell you which way? Um, I've got a couple levels on, on, on the, on the Dixie 9565 is important geometric support and where this trend line comes in right okay. here. You see, this yeah. is the, this is the half. I've heard that number from various sources. Okay, yeah. So on. that's, that's a good number. If we hold that and we can move up here, we can go all the way up to the next, the resistance here, this geometric resistance up here is in the 104 area. Okay. And obviously if we clear that, you know, you got, you got a lot of fresh air here to, to move. Okay. So we're uh, really at a critical juncture. Critical, critical spot. Yeah. Here's Euro USD that makes up over 50% of, of, of right. the Dixie. So you can see we're at a critical spot in the Euro. Um, I know a lot of people are calling for a higher Euro, but we're right up against it right now. Yeah. Um, and if, if we see weakness, this is the geometric support and that's at parity. Yeah. That's at one. Nice look. Yeah. And if we break out, if we break out, uh, you're talking about up here, you have geometric resistance on the Euro in the uh, it's, it's like the 118, 119 area. Okay. So you, you could have a hell of a run if we get out. Um, 10 year treasuries. I wanted to show this chart because even though the Fed is sort of sitting on this market and, and, you know, damping volatility, there is a big move coming. Um, these circles generally hold price. Um, and here we've had about four touches at the edge of the circle. And when you come out of the circle, you see dramatic moves. So we're either going to go down here and test this support or we're going to go up here and test resistance and break out to new highs. So um, I think the 10 year treasury, like all these other markets, I mean, that the, the interesting thing, and this is what I, I look for in, in the cycle work I do is what are the cycles saying? And then are the charts also in showing me similar, similar signals. And the signal is we're going to get some big moves in markets very, very soon. And that's commensurate with all the cycle work that we, that we talked about in the 74 analog. Um, here's the ES monthly. So here's, here's some important levels on ES. Uh, 3025 area is very important geometric support. So if we get below 3025, I would say things are looking pretty good on a, on a monthly basis, like we're going to be heading down and we'll see how deep the correction goes. The, the geometric um, resistance up here on, on the trend line resistance is all the way up to 3320. So there's, there's a lot of air up there to run if it wants to run. Okay. Week, weekly is another look. It, it sort of dials it in a little for you. 3270 yeah. is the bingo number. If we get to 3270 and, and, and can't break out, that would be a failure. If we get above that, you're looking at new highs. Uh, okay. On this, 3025 is the number. So that 3025 area comes up on both the monthly and the weekly in terms of a, a, a critical area to see if, if we're actually going to start this correction. Okay. Uh, we talked about inflation. 
one of the areas that I'm seeing that um, there's big bases building and, and charts are, are starting to give signals that we're going to see some moves is the grains. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a weather event this summer or something's, something's going to happen that's going to affect the crop because, you know, it's all about that marginal supply. Um, but they're, the charts are saying they're not going down anymore. They just aren't going up yet. So these things are something we're watching on a, on a daily, daily and weekly basis, looking for the signal of when to get long. But here on beans, you can see we've essentially been building a base for four or five years had this little false break a few months back, you know, last, uh, last fall had a false break and now we're building and we're building and we're building. So I'm watching soybeans for uh, a signal to, to start getting long there. Same thing in wheat. It's actually a little further along than beans, but again, look at the base that was built four year base yeah. beginning, beginning to turn up. Testing this downtrend line. The moves. Well, it's interesting you bring up four or five year bases uh, earlier in the show where Blake was showing a weekly euro chart. And basically, we've had five years of base building there, too. And it's, it's happening in market after market yeah. after market. So, yeah. cycle wise, it's saying there's, there's big moves so coming. So, is there one more shoe to drop before lows are in, or are we on the verge of breaking out? on all of these markets that's really that's the question here yeah. yep that's the question here's corn six-year base in corn yeah and we're sitting on support yeah uh let's go we'll go through these quickly here's gold everybody wants to talk about gold yeah. look at this beautiful circle how it's held price here yeah and again there's a big move coming out of here no doubt this 1800 level is crucial. You, you, we clear that it's up, up and away, man. Yeah. 2300. 2, well, we'll be coming out of this circle in another month or so, right? That, that's correct. Okay. Yep. So big moves are coming in gold and I'm very bullish on gold. Same with silver, but look at silver. Look at the base on silver on a monthly basis. Grains. Yeah. It looks like a grain, doesn't it? It looks like the mm -hmm. grain charts. Silver's building a tremendous base. Now we still have this downtrend line to deal with, but once we break out, silver, mm -hmm. silver could run. There's no yeah. question about it. I'm bullish on gold and silver, very bullish. Um, crude's another one. And here's, here you can see an example of what happens when we break out of the circle. Yeah. We, had, we had crude in this circle, rising right. nicely, came out yeah. of the circle. Look at the move out of there. Like that. Now we hit support here. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on support here. The issue with, with crude, I think, is unlike all those other charts where we're seeing those bases, you're up on a spike. So you got, you got work to do here before, before I think we see a sustained advance on crude. Okay. Uh, you guys were talking about the VIX, and, and it's funny because I think the VIX, the VIX fits perfectly with one of the cycles that we're, we're, um, we're watching here. We are right now... Um, in a period where there's a high probability, I mean, greater than 90% and in, in the period goes from now until late July, early August, there's a greater than 90% probability that we see big moves in volatility. Uh, if you look at the VIX chart, it's telling you the same thing. Um, the pullback while, while dramatic on the VIX is resting right on key structural and yep. geometric support. Yep. So we're at you're the low dry. end of the new regime of volatility. Yep. And your, your call, your idea of VIX calls, I think is perfect. I've been, yeah. I've been adding VIX calls, you know, uh, as the market allows me, cause I think Let's strike I'm actually buying some VXX. Oh, okay. So, so it's, right. it's the leveraged version. Uh, but how do you know where to set, where to center the circle? Amira Cohn is asking. Um, you, you have to use geometry and you look for touches on, on the edges of the circle. Subscribe to Ben's service. He'll teach you. <laughs> he will. He'll teach you. Won't it's a, you? It's a free service on Twitter. I just oh, post stuff on Twitter. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, last couple charts. Here's, you know, the things I'm talking about are very, we've, so far we've talked about are very big cycles. As a trader, you got to eat, 
right? You got to put food on the table. You have to eat. So in addition to doing this big sort of macro stuff and positioning, we also look at, you know, sort of the day-to-day hand-to-hand combat. Um, This is an ES four-hour chart showing um, support and resistance levels that we use to gauge uh, where the market is in a short-term cycle. Like where is it what's the most probable thing it can do? Are we on support? Are we on resistance? So we use this to frame the daily action. And then we post these fuse lines every day on Twitter for free that show um, where price, these in combination with the patterns at plus three forecasts, which are in the pinned tweet, you can get a real edge in short-term trading. And these are ones, this isn't cherry picking. This is just from Monday's action. We had this, we call this a hellfire pattern around the line. We're on top of the line. So you look for a breakout of the triangle and then you get this kind of move. Same thing here. This was the line that was generated later in the day. These are dynamic lines. You break out of the pattern, you get a nice move. So this, this is kind of what we do to, to, to take care of the short term. There you go. And that's it. That's, that's so your the best way. This is the only place people who follow you is uh, at Ben Maldonado. I'm sure glad you changed it to your name instead of Ben G. M. M. <laughs> right. Right, buddy. Right. Yeah, that's okay, right. Okay. So, you know, Ben, uh, Ben's work, uh, I think is out, uh, outstanding. Uh, telescope, you know, one of the rare guys that can use a telescope and a microscope. So this is where you follow him at at Ben Maldonado. Another great presentation, Ben. Thank you, Dale. And if, um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, you can just hit me on on Twitter or, you know, run them through Dale because I'm I'm on the show every day. And I think if if you're a trader and you're trying to get better in the markets, if you don't spend every day on this webinar, you're just selling yourself short. Because every day you can learn something. So uh, we'll continue the bromance. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe the end of August you could come back and uh, I'll get a hold of you on Twitter, Ben. Thanks for edifying our community with your great work today. Thanks, Dale. Best of luck. All right. My trading warrior brother, Ben Maldonado. Follow him on romance. On, on romance. <laughs> on, on Twitter <laughs> at Ben Maldonado. All right, everyone. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Don't just count your pips, count your blessings.